Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for having me. Uh, my name is Itai. As Fago said, I'm from Uruguay, so I am a little stressed right now. We, just, um, I, we are out of the World Cup, so I have to relax a little bit. Sorry if I make some mistakes on, the, on this presentation. It's my, my first talk, so I will probably have some mistakes because of this. Okay, so uh, as I said, I'm Itai. I do iOS at MediaLab. Uh, and we are, I am going to talk about some attack vectors on iOS and some how to f work around them, some fixes so we can protect our users or our, our application from, from, from attackers. Before starting, I will give a brief introduction about who we are. MediaLab is a holding company of global br brands. We acquire a company to boost our ads exchange. That this means that we have to serve millions of monthly active users and we have to serve billions of requests every, every month. And each one of these requests has to comply the same level of security and privacy for each, each one of the applications and users. This is because if you have fraud in your application, your, your app might get flagged and you will get a lot of rest, less revenue in your, for your application. In this talk, I will, I'm going to talk about some concepts of security and why should, should we take measures are on, at the application level. After this, I will, we will see some attacks on iOS and how to take measures around them. This includes insecure, insecure data storage, unvalidated user input, man in the middle attacks, reverse engineering, the dangers of third party libraries, and app redistribution. The first concept I will talk about is the CIA triad. It's a common model for that forms the basis of development of security systems. It's an acronym for confidentiality, integrity, and availability. Confidentiality involves the effort to make sure that data is kept secret and private, and only people with proper privileges can access secure information. Integrity involves making sure that your data is trustworthy and free from tampering. And availability involves making sure that people with access to specific information must be able to consume it when they need to. In this, in this talk, we we'll start to talk mostly about the first two ones, but this doesn't mean that there are no measures we can take to, to improve the availability of our application. OK, but why, why should we take measures at the application level? There are common scenarios for this. For example, you might handle private information, like financial records, medical records. Your, your server may rely from, from input from, from your application. Maybe your application contains some important algorithms you might want to protect so it's don't, they, they don't get stolen. And when you di distribute the application in the App Store, some developers may think that the, their app is secure, that everything is secure, and nobody can tamper with your application and the, net, and the networking to, with your server. But the truth is that Apple does take some measures to protect apps from tampering, but this doesn't cover everything. So in some cases, you might want to take some additional measures. The first at, uh, attack I will present is uh, insecure data storage uh, for storing information on the file system. Most developers probably know we have a, a, a variety of uh, storage options on iOS. We have user defaults, core data, local SQLite databases, Kitchen, and the secure enclave. These are the ones provided by, by Apple. We have more, for example, Realm, Firebase, uh, real-time database. But we are go I am going to talk just from the one from, from Apple. From, from Apple. Uh, the, the difference between this is that the, only the, the two last ones are protected by default from, by Apple. The, the Kitchen is a local database encrypted on, on the, by the operating system, while the Secure Enclave is a hardware coprocessor that can store uh, some information, like pri private keys, for example, to, to encrypt this, uh, the Kitchen. This means that the rest of the storage options are not protected by default, so anyone with access to our app container folder can see and edit them. For example, this is really easy to do. Oh, the, and one way for, for doing this is using a backup from, from, our, from our iPhone. Using publicly available tools, we can extract the backup, see all everything that is inside our, our application, or our, our, our application for the container. For example, here we can see the, we have a core, core data model and the user defaults at the preference folder. The, the through is that user defaults is just a dictionary. It's um, a playlist that you can re really easily open, edit, see it, 
an edit and restore it to the backup. That means if you upload the restore the backup to your iPhone, you will get all the changes on your application. And the same happens with the, the, the SQLite database for core data. It is a little more complex, but it's, it's just a database, so you can uh, open and edit it. And there are special tools for, for editing core, core data uh, mo models. Uh, that, as I said, we can see all this information, and we can also edit all, all of this. As I, as I said before, the, the kitchen is only the only, the only one protected by the, one of the one of the ones protected by default by Apple. So it is a be much better place to store sensitive information like tokens or some, if you need passwords or API keys. But it has its limitations because you can't uh, store a big amount of data here. So you, and if you have to store big, big amounts of data, but you want to protect it also. So in this case, you might want to encrypt this, this file with, a, with a, 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 a key that you are storing on the, at, at the keychain. And then you can exclude this file from the backup, so it never gets out of the, of the phone. You can, we, for this, we can use the resource values, a property or, of our files, so it gets ignored on, from all the backups. Going with the next attack, it's not uncommon to, to see web browsers inside the applications to show, for example, a company website or, that, or some message that it needs to, to be delivered very quickly for like a marketing campaign, for example. This problem, but the problem is if, how are these interactions triggered? Are, are they accessible by a deep link? If, uh, can they be, this, this deep link be launched from outside of the application? The, this can be a big problem if the, if the deep links are not correctly protected or they are not even validated. So this is because when you op when generally when you open a deep link, you don't see the user won't see what's the deep link there is inside the deep link. They just what will see that the app launches. So and since they are going to get inside your application, they may think that they are browsing your app, your website, and they may trust all the information. It's not uncommon to see phishing attacks with this, and they they will try to get your user and password, user and password so they may to steal, the, to steal information from them. This is one of the easiest cases for phishing. My opinion is this matter, that it's better to, if you need to have this, this browser, because there are a lot of cases for this, you should, you should only open your company website, for example, using a, a domain list or just your, your domain. Uh, we can use a regular, regular expression too, but in this case, you have to be careful because regular expressions are made by lead more than that you really want, so you have to really test them and see that there are no other websites that, that are, they're gonna open. And because irregular expressions can be extracted from your app binary, any hacker may, want, may, may, may see it and may find any attack for, for it. Another option is that if you really need your application to open any URL, you might want to sign your request using a private key because your deep links on iOS don't, there, there are no real limits for, for, what, for how long they can be. So there's a limit of like four kilobytes, so it's a lot of text. So this is not a problem for, for this. Or maybe you will just have to open your domain and then you re redirect the user to the final destination. So, so you can really validate all the, all the URLs that are being opened on your application. The next attack is a really popular one. It's man in the middle. Uh, probably most of us use it for, for debugging to see all the networking, all the requests are, that are going from our application to see the request, edit them maybe, see what's going on, why did this debug happen to this specific user. But technically it is an, it is an attack and because HTTPS is, a pro, is an encryption met, met protocol to protect the information between the, the client and the server, and while HTTPS is commonly unbreakable, in some cases, hackers may discover loopholes in the network communication between your application and the server. I may want to seek to be in the, in the, in here in the middle, and they, if they get to, to this, they will read, alter, and misuse all the messages between your application and the, and the server, which can be a huge risk if you are, as we said before, you are handling important private information. But luckily for us, it's really easy to avoid this. We can just pin the certificate or the public key of the certificate. This means that each request made to your server 
the, the application will verify the, this, uh, this, this certificate at the, at the server. If it doesn't match the certificate that you have in your application, the request will not go through and no, no data will be, will be leaked. There are many ways to do this, but I will, we are going to use Trustkit and URL session, but this can be easily be done with uh, WK WebView uh, and, and Alamo Fire, for example. The first step is to download the certificate because we need to get the, the hash for, for it. Uh, Trustkit, uh, they, they provide us for, with a script to, for doing this. You just have to use Python, get pin certificate from the certificate, and we can, you already get the Objective-C code the, for, for this. We can see that there's a public hash at the last, at the last line that we have the, the hash here. here. Then we just create the, our configuration for Trustkit. It's really, really easy to do. We just have to add the domain we want to do. In this case, it's app.com. We want here we, we are enforcing the, the pinning. This means that if it doesn't match, the, app, the, the request will not go through. And we also want to add all the subdomains because we know that app, Apple developer.apple.com is using the same root certificate for this. And then we, for last, we add the hash we got from the previous step. And when we can start uh, checking all the, all the requests from, from our, our application. For last, using the URL session delegate, we have an, an, an authentication challenge method for this. And we just have to forward this, uh, this challenge to the, our trusted instance we used before with, a, with our configuration. And we are going to get, be validating all the requests from, from our application. But it's, it's going to be validating only requests for Apple, not any other domain. So you might want to add all the domains you, you, you need. Or you can just re reject all the other domains if you, if you want. But if you are doing it like this, this means that if, while we are developing, while we are debugging our application, it means that we won't be able to use Proximan or Charles. So we might want to add a little macro to avoid this, like, uh, like this. Uh, if debug, ignore, ignore this. We should also keep in mind that uh, if we change the certificate for any reason, for example, because it is expired or it, it was compromised, the request will stop working for this application. So we may want to take measures so all our, our users are using the last version with the last uh, certificate we have. Well, OK, once we ship uh, our application to, to, your, to your users, they are protected. But uh, we, are, we ship our application to them. They do have all our, all of, all our logic inside with their, on, their, on their devices. And if they get, get handle of uh, our application, a uh, decrypted binary, for example, using a chair broken device, or there are tools for downloading them from, from the web, they can really see, see our, our logic inside our binary. For example, if we have this easy cl simple class, it's called my class. It has uh, one method called encrypt, and two private methods called uh, store encryption that receives uh, one argument, and uh, my pass, which is a, fun a, fun a method that just contains the or password as, as a literal. It's really easy to, to it's a really easy cl a class, and if we disassemble our, our application, we can see that we can see all our methods for, for our application in the, in the binary. We can see we have the my pass on the first line. We have the store encryption. We also have the, the init and the init that they are built automatically by the compiler. And we also have the encrypt, encrypt method for, for us. It doesn't matter if, if they are private or public. They are going to be on the, on the binary. And if we open them, we can really easy, with the modern disassemblers, we can really easy build Pseudo code from them, and we can see the, the password there, so it's not really being protected. If we do the same for the encrypt method, uh, it's a little, we can see that it's calling another, another method called XOR encryption. So if we follow through the, the logic, we can see the, la the last one is the XOR encryption. Here, the pseudo code is much harder to understand. It's not really easy to, to see it because there are a lot of variables it, because it's doing more logic. But uh, for the unexperienced eye, we can really see that there is a, 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 a call to my pass. We also know that there is a, a really specific name for this method, SOAR encryption. So we, because of this, because of the good practices of uh, programming, we already know what we are doing. So we are encrypting with this password. But uh, 
probably, okay, may, let's change the, the name to something different. But uh, that's just adding one step to, to the attacker. They can just, when, once they get the, the new name, they will still get, get to, to attack us. But there are process for doing, for doing this automatically. They are called, they are called uh, obfuscators. They will uh, change our name our automatically. Let's see. The, this uh, this why, like what the of, something like the obfuscator could do, for example, or encrypt or encrypt method will just do random hoops inside, add the uh, unnecessary steps, but it will still do the same logic to encrypt. This is because it will add more more steps, uh, change names, encrypt, rename uh, all the all the variables. All the, all, the, all the classes and the methods. So if someone is attacking our application or they're reverse engineering it, it will be harder for, for them. It's not going to be impossible, but we, we can do this. There are many commercial solutions for doing this, but we also have free and open source ones. Uh, thanks to the latest version of uh, LDLBM, our compiler, we can use obfuscators as plugins. You, there is a new project called OMBLL, it's an open source obfuscator by Romain Thomas that can, we can use uh, Xcode 14 to, uh, to obfuscate our code. In this, this, the project is still a beta, but we can already see promising results. For example, on the, on the left, we, we can see that we have the, the default live set library for, for zip files, that there's a lot, there are a lot of strings. It also contains a lot of, of methods. But if we look at the, at the right one, with the one of the one, we see that there are a lot of less strings and because they are being encrypted by, by the, the obfuscator. When, uh, for, when the next attack, there are third-party libraries. When building a mobile app, it's really common to use third-party libraries, for example, for analytics, crash reports, networking, Maybe you have an internal SDK from, from, your, from your company. It could be a, it, it's, this is an example where we have a, our private source, the, we have the public source from Cocoa Pods, then we have a, a couple of, of dependencies. And tot here, total, it's, it, this is totally fine, but with a little change, we get a vulnerable dependencies profile for pod file, where because, this is because you, we have the public source on the, at the top. This means that CocoaPods, when it will, get to, will try to get all the dependencies for installing, it will first try with the public source, and if it doesn't find it, it will use our private repo. This means if someone finds our, my, my company SDK name and version registered at the public source, we are, we are going to have trouble. They, are, they will be able to install uh, uh, things on our, compa on our company apps. And if you are not correctly validating uh, what we, what, when we compile, it, w it might get published to the, to the App Store. The problem with this is everything you install on your, on your application will have the same access and privilege privileges your app does. That means they will be able to read our user defaults and our kitchen. That can be very dangerous. Uh, this can be really easy, it can easily be done because uh, Coco, when CocoaPods builds our application, when we have uh, frameworks, uh, dynamic frameworks, all the the info list for these frameworks contain our, uh, our dependency name and version, so they, it, an attacker can easily get uh, this information. And um, luckily for us, CocoaPods does warn, does warn us if there's a source change for a dependency. But if you accidentally deleted the podfile.log, you, you, you will still get the one from, from the public source. The, this means that the most secure way, way for, for, for pod files is just use a private repository for everything, even, even, even your dependencies. And you may even want to cl clone them and have, it, have them on a, public, on a private repo because there have been cases where public dependencies have been, the owners of the dependencies have been hacked, and, and hackers have uploaded malicious code as new versions for some, for some dependencies. Okay, so malicious third-party dependencies can inject malicious code in our applications, but is there any other supply chain attack for, for, for iOS? There is one, it happened on 20, 2015, 
uh, where, where some companies on, uh, mainly on, on Asia used a, a bad version of its code, which in, injected the malicious code on all each app built with, with it, and it uplo uploaded information from all 100 million users to a the random uh, server for, 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 the, for the attackers. This happened because they were using and they were using a, an authorized version of its code. They didn't download them from the proper uh, places, for, for example, Apple Store or the developer's uh, site, or they didn't even use the its code install script that we know it is, it is trustworthy because the, the code is open source and we can see all the sources it is using. And the last one is the app redistribution. It's not un uncommon to see your app redistributed. If you, you have a premium features, you may, want, you may see this application called uh, Plus Plus because they have more features in enabled. Uh, this is because with a decrypted binary, it's really easy to edit them, the, the code with, the, with, uh, with uh, the compiler or the disassembler or injecting co more code using many tools. And then you can sign it again and upload it to your device using side loading. And while redistribution itself may not be a problem for you, you might want to block this person from communicating with your server because they may be uh, tampering to the, all, the, all these requests or possibly abuse from more requests to inform because of these changes. In this case, Apple Task provides a tool for us to, to verify the integrity of the installation of your app. It's called Apple Attest. It was started on iOS 14 and can help us verify that, that all the requests coming from our, our, um, our applications, it's coming from a valid instance of, of our application. It uses the secure enclave to store the private key, and, to, and it's unique to each app installation. This means that it's going to survive app update, and, but not app installs. To use it, we just have to generate an, a, public, a key for, for a device, but we, but we can't really trust our, our own device because it can be compromised. So we are going to use our server and the Apple, uh, Apple servers. The, pro the process consists of getting a challenge from your server, which can be used to, it's going to be used to generate an attestation with, with Apple server. Uh, but as I said before, we are not going to validate this. So we are going to get, upload this, this uh, attestation object and to, to our server again. It contains two pieces of information. One is the attestation object, and there's also a certificate for this. Then, for doing, then on the server, we do a, this, a lot of validation to do. I'm going to resume this, a, a brief overview. We are going to check the certificate comes from, from Apple. We are going to, be, to, to, to check that the certificate was generated using the challenge we sent before. We are going to check that the certificate and the attestation object match. We are going to um, verify that the station is really for our application or our developer, and it's, going, it's for uh, the production environment. And we are going to check that this, this attestation has never been, been used before because it has to be new. Then if we have verified all of this, we can, we, we can trust this uh, object, we can trust this uh, key, and we can uh, associate it with our, uh, our user and the, and the and device. Uh, you, we also get uh, some more uh, information, like there's um, a receipt for getting fraud metrics from this uh, key to see if this, going to, is, if this one is doing too many requests or there's maybe some fraud coming from, from, this, from this key. Then, if we, when you, we want to get a secure requ request from, from our application, we, for example, to access premium content or sensitive information, we just send a new challenge to our application and we do the attestation again, but at this time we, we already trust the, the key, so we just have to validate all the attest only the attestation object at, at the server level to see if, if there, to see if the counter is increasing, and if it matches all uh, it matches the key we uh, saved for this user and device. I would like to say that this is not a jailbreak check because uh, we can't really. Uh, trust any jailbreak check because if the operating system is compromised, we can't really uh, trust anything inside, of, inside here. So it's going just to, to verify the inter the, that the install is valid, not that the, it, everything is, is secure. And that's all. Thank you.
Thank you for the talk, Itai. Uh, yes, we have a bunch of questions for, for you, but uh, for time's sake, we are going to uh, do the top oh. three most voted. Um, so uh, our most voted question uh, asks, uh, where is the most appropriate place to store encryption keys? Uh, if you can get it to the secure enclave, it will be the best one because it's a hardware coprocessor, but you can store it on the, on the kitchen. So it's, it's a safe place. OK. Can we have travel uh, with Apple Store revision for using source code obfuscator? Mm, there's no official the, the information about this because there, ha there are not many, many uh, uh, public uh, sources for this, but it, it says that itself, you probably don't really want to obfuscate all your code because you, it adds more steps, your app will be slower, so you might just want to obfuscate your important logic. For this, so you you shouldn't get any problem with this. I have uploaded of scattered code to the App Store, and I didn't have any problem with this. Okay, and the last one: um, security audits are not really common on mobile. What are good resources developers, good resources for developers can use to build a case uh, for man for management approving conducting audits on apps? Mm. I know there, there, there are some services for, for doing audits on, on apps. They are usually black box, so they don't, don't see what's, what's the code of the, of the app. Just they t try it on a device, try to see if it, you are checking your, the, the, pin, the certificate pinning, they see what are you storing on your device. But the, I don't really have a best place to see that. There are a lot of information on, on, online to see. So. If someone really know to have a question, I, will, I can search and find, find the best answers for that case. OK. You have some homework, it seems. <laughs> <laughs> OK, let's give it a, give a big applause.